This is 16-year-old Michaela Bali. She is frantic. She is trying to get in touch with someone, but to no avail. She has a plan, or maybe it's someone else's plan. Hours later, she vanishes off the face of the earth. No one has a clue as to what happened. This was back in April, 2016. To this day, Michaela is still missing. What happened that day? Did her erratic behavior in her last days point to a plan to disappear? Or did something much darker and more sinister happen to her? Let's explore the full story of Michaela Bali and the theories that surround her disturbing disappearance. Our story begins in Saskatchewan, Canada, in the quaint little town of Yorkton. Yorkton's official motto, where good things happen. Considering this case, that's very creepy. Michaela Margaret Kim Bali was born on July 2nd, 1999 in Regina. She grew up in Yorkton with her mom, Paula, who worked as a consultant for the Ministry of Social Services. Michaela's father is not officially known and he wasn't an active part of Michaela's upbringing, but she had a big happy family nonetheless. She lived with her mom, aunt, grandmother, and two younger siblings. Michaela was described as a shy, but warm and friendly girl. She was well-liked at school and had a few best friends, but above all, she loved her family. The Bollies would play the piano and violin together, and one time, Michaela learned to play the accordion too, just to surprise her aunt on her birthday. Paula said she wasn't engaged in dangerous, risky behaviors, no mental health issues, no substance issues, no temper tantrums or threats of running away, no sneaking out. When invited to sleepovers, she would usually call by 11 p.m. to be picked up. She was a homebody. When Michaela did experience some bullying because of her acne, she didn't seem to be very affected by it. She had a tight-knit group of friends and a loving family, and she didn't need everyone at school to like her. Her family was filled with role models, and so Michaela dreamt of being a teacher or a vet. She loved children and animals equally, and she loved caring for others and helping them get better. Her family had no doubt she was on the right track. In April 2016, Michaela was a junior at Sacred Heart High School. Over the course of a few days, Michaela told four of her friends that she was going on a vacation. Some heard she was going to Regina, where she was born. Others heard a long list of places Michaela claimed she wanted to visit. On April 2nd, Michaela woke up at the same time as her mother, as per usual. They always got dressed and had breakfast together as they chatted about the day to come. According to Paula, there was nothing unusual about that morning. April 2nd was just a really regular morning in our house. I think the difficult thing was just how regular of a day that was and that nothing was out of the ordinary. Michaela's grandma and Paula's mom, Margaret, dropped Paula off at work. Then Michaela was off at school. At 3.40 p.m., Margaret showed up at school to pick her up and take her to music class, but Michaela was nowhere to be found. Michaela's grandmother was worried. This was the first time Michaela wasn't waiting for her outside of school. And if there were any delays or changes in plans, she would let her family know right away. Everyone had a smartphone and they were always in constant contact. It wasn't like Michaela to just disappear without a text. Still, Margaret decided not to imagine the worst possible scenario yet. Perhaps Michaela was still inside the school chatting with her friends. Maybe she'd forgotten about the time for a second. So she went inside the school looking for Michaela and asking her friends if they'd seen her around. But the more questions she asked, the more worried she'd get. Michaela's teachers told her that she hadn't shown up to any of her classes that day. And some of her schoolmates said they'd seen her talk to her early in the morning, but she left before noon. Needless to say, Margaret was pretty worried by now. So she drove over to Paula's office and let her know what was happening. Initially, Paula was the voice of reason. She calmed her mother down and told her there must be a misunderstanding. Her daughter was just probably somewhere on the school grounds or at a friend's house. After all, she was 16. At that age, people can change quickly, turning from shy homebodies to slightly more reckless rebels. Maybe Michaela was becoming a bit more independent and didn't want to contact her family for every little thing she did. Paula and her mom drove over to Michaela's school once again. This time, they looked through every nook and cranny. 
People were watching Paula look under tables, buses, and cars. Clearly, she was desperate to find her daughter. When they concluded that she wasn't at school, Paula and Margaret went over to music class where Michaela was supposed to be. They were hoping someone else drove her there. She wasn't there either, and this was very unsettling. Michaela had spent the previous night rehearsing on her violin for hours. She had a recital coming up, and she was clearly excited about it. So why would she miss the music class? And worse, why wouldn't Michaela answer her phone? The two women returned home in a panic. Paula knew what to look for. She had a large stash of hidden cash inside the house, and Michaela knew about it. In fact, she was allowed to use money from the stash if she needed it. If she'd run away from home, she would have taken the cash, her mom thought. But the stash was intact, and nothing else seemed to be missing from the house. Michaela's phone charger, makeup, and other prized possessions were still in her bedroom, untouched. Clearly, something horrible had happened to her. At 8 p.m., Paula called the police and reported her daughter missing. On the morning of April 13th, the Sachuan police turned up at Sacred Heart High School. They wanted to speak to everyone who knew Michaela and figure out potential scenarios. Was she a teenage runaway or had she suffered a horrific fate? As they spoke to Michaela's friends, the detectives started painting an odd picture, particularly when they spoke to Shelby and Oksana, Michaela's best friends. On April 11th, the three of them went to get lunch and Michaela told them she wanted to go on a big vacation. She wanted to see Moose Jaw, Prince Albert, and her natal town of Regina. At the time, this this didn't seem so strange to Shelby and Oksana. They all wanted to move to a bigger town after graduating from high school. Yorkton was a boring place for a teenager and they all had academic ambitions. Neither of them thought Michaela wanted to leave urgently. Michaela had also told one of her friends that she had $5,000 in her bank account. This would later turn up to be untrue. The same day Michaela went to her usual Christian ethics class when her teacher noticed she was acting very strange. She was more upset and less engaged than usual. Also, the teacher didn't think much of it. Any person is entitled to have mood changes every now and then, 16 year olds maybe even more so. After school at 4.35 p.m., Michaela messaged Oksana, asking if they could drive her to a local TD bank the next morning on April 12th. She insisted it was really important. An hour later, she called the bank three times. She then transferred $25 into her account. Around 9 p.m., Michaela sent multiple text messages to her ex, Shelby, and Oksana. She confessed she wasn't happy and she needed a quick vacation to Regina, but no one foresaw what came next. On the morning of April 12th, Margaret dropped Michaela off at school at around 8 a.m. CCTV footage shows Michaela putting something into her locker. At 8.08 a.m., Michaela logged into the school's Wi-Fi. 20 minutes later, she left the school via the back door. She arrived at the local TD bank just before 9 a.m., waiting for the bank to open its doors. She was seen talking on the phone at 8.55. Then she hung up and entered the bank. There, she withdrew $55. Then she walked to Terry's Pawn and Bargain, a pawn shop just behind the bank. She tried to sell the owner her silver ring, but Terry said the ring wasn't valuable enough to buy. According to Terry, Michaela didn't seem stressed out. She calmly left the shop after he rejected her offer. Michaela was then spotted by CCTV at a Wendy's slash Tim Hortons restaurant. She bought a drink and then sat in a booth facing away from the entrance. Michaela oscillated between looking at her phone and looking at the entrance as if she was expecting someone. Then it gets even stranger. At one point, Michaela is seen taking her phone apart and then reassembling it. At 9.23, Michaela exited the Wendy's. Then she came back in and went through a different exit. Just 20 minutes later, Michaela was caught on a different camera inside the same restaurant. This time, she was on the phone with someone, and another thing changed. She sat facing the doors. At 10.12 a.m., Michaela texted Shelby something distressing. Hey, I need help. She didn't say what she needed help with. 
Shelby was at school during a class, so she didn't answer right away. So half an hour later, it was Michaela who texted again. Never mind, I figured it out. On the phone again, Michaela then left the restaurant a second time. A few minutes later, she came back in. This was the third time Michaela was entering the Wendy's. Imagine seeing this footage as a detective. What are your first thoughts? From 10.39 to 10.43, Michaela was on the phone. Then she hung up and approached a woman sitting at another table. The police eventually tracked the woman down and she confirmed that Michaela was in a frantic state. She asked the woman if she could help her rent a hotel room. After the woman said no, Michaela yet again called someone and still on the phone, she left the restaurant for a final time. Then she texted Shelby, I'll see you at school. And she proceeded to walk to Sacred Heart High School where she arrived just before noon. So she missed all her morning classes, but she came back in time for the lunch break. Then she told two schoolmates that she was going to take a bus to Regina. At 12.02, Michaela left her high school. She was inside for less than five minutes. She was again on her phone. Then here's the last CCTV footage of Michaela. She is walking away from school minutes after she told her friends she would be leaving town. Since the police had no more CCTV footage of her, they put together all the witness accounts they could and continued the timeline from there. After 12 o'clock, witnesses saw Michaela at the Trail Stop restaurant, just a mile away from her school. This is a restaurant connected to the bus depot where you can get a bus to a nearby town. Michaela had poutine and then spoke to a bus depot employee about the bus to Regina. The employee told Michaela the next bus would be at 5 p.m. Michaela didn't get a ticket though. At 1.45 p.m., she left the Trail Stop restaurant. This was the last account of Michaela Bali. When the police and Michaela's family tried to reach her on the phone on April 13th, it had been turned off. You might say, okay, but the police can still access phone records even without the physical phone as evidence, right? Well, sometimes they can. But you see, Michaela always called her friends via apps, Snapchat and Kick. With these apps, the calls never enter records. Everything is deleted as soon as it ends. This was a bit secretive for a 16 year old. Normally, teenagers expose their lives on social media more than adults, so what was Michaela hiding? As the detectives looked at her life, they saw what her mother once described a homebody. Michaela was a shy family girl with a passion for music and drama. She had zero history of breaking the rules, running away, or going against authority in any way. However, Michaela did have a history of self-harm. In her official police description, it stated that she had several scars on her thigh as a result of this. She was obsessed with the Hunger Games series, playing League of Legends and taking landscape photographs. She was also into playing an extreme version of hide and seek with her brother and sister. What that entails, one can only guess, but clearly Michaela had a penchant for hiding. Could her disappearance be linked to this? The only thing detectives could say for sure was that according to her general personality, Michaela's behavior on April 12th was beyond strange. Clearly, she knew something was afoot or was planning an exit by herself or with someone else. But because of her mysterious app calls, the detectives couldn't find out who she was talking to that day. It took the police 10 months to get access to Michaela's social media accounts. And even then, she couldn't get to the calls she made in April. Throughout 2016 and 2017, tips were pouring in when it came to finding Michaela. There were possible sightings of her in town, in Alberta, Vancouver, and various other parts of Canada, but none were confirmed. Sadly, in many missing person cases, some of the people who phone the police with clues are just looking for attention or trying to expose their own theories. But this just wastes the police's time. A few months after her disappearance, Michaela's case was passed on to the general investigation section. This meant that the case would be treated as a serious offense, kidnapping or murder. There was one tip that led the detectives to consider the seriousness of this case. 
In May 2016, one witness said he'd seen Michaela leave the Bus Depot restaurant with a man wearing a flaming cross tattoo on his forearm. Within 24 hours, this drawing was shown on all TV stations, and people were urged to come forward with any information regarding this man. But lo and behold, the man himself turned up at the police station. He said he'd only held the door for Michaela at the restaurant. He did not know her, and he did not interact with her in any way. Indeed, his story could be backed up and the suspicions were cleared. Then there was a hint of social media activity. To this day, Michaela has been completely off the grid on social media. Her phone was never turned on again and her bank accounts had not been accessed. But in July 2016, there was a tiny update on Snapchat. Shelby had been sending Michaela several messages, hoping her bestie would get in touch with her, at least to let her know she was safe. The messages went unopened for three months, but then it appeared as if Michaela opened Shelby's messages. But this might have just been a little error on behalf of Snapchat. You see, Snapchat deletes inactive accounts as well as unopened snaps. And sometimes before they're deleted, they appear red even though they were never opened. So it hasn't been confirmed whether Michaela opened Shelby's snaps or it was just an error before they were deleted. Another strange social media hint was Michaela's Instagram account. Well, first of all, she had multiple Instagram accounts, which again was a bit unusual as she was 16 years old, had no business page, and all accounts had the same content more or less. One of her Instagram accounts had a pretty big follower count, yet when the police looked at it, it had zero posts. Either the photos had been deleted or it was a fake account. And her Instagram bio, it just said goodbye. A creepy message that pointed at the theory that Michaela left her life in Yorktown of her own volition. The detectives also searched every Yorkton hotel for witness accounts or records of Michaela getting a room. After all, if she was leaving home on her own, she would have to find somewhere to stay. And remember what she asked that woman inside of Wendy's? That's right if she could help her rent a hotel room. The woman told the police she'd refused because Michaela didn't look old enough to get a hotel room, but what if someone else had helped her? However, the police found nothing in Yorkton. No one had seen Michaela since April 12th, and no hotels showed her name or face on CCTV or in reception records. For some reason though, the police only searched Yorkton hotels. Even though Michaela had told several of her friends that she was planning to visit Regina for a vacation. As the police seemed further and further away from getting answers, more and more theories popped up. People were desperate to understand Michaela's strange disappearance. One theory stated that Michaela was searching for her father. Michaela never knew who he was. Her mom, Paula, was very secretive about it. At school, Michaela would tell those who asked about him either he was dead or that he lived far away, but her best buddies knew she didn't know him. And she'd also said that she wanted to meet him in the past. So for people like Shelby and Oksana, this theory didn't seem impossible. But months into the investigation, a man named Rick Wright appeared, claiming he was her biological dad and he was not with her. Michaela's father, Rick Bright, told Dateline he was not involved in his daughter's life. He says he was contacted by police five days after she went missing and began to search for her on his own. He says he hopes Michaela is safe and he wants to tell her that he is sorry for all the lost time. According to Rick, Michaela never made contact with him. Rick is active in the search for Michaela to this day, keeping a Facebook page dedicated to her and inviting people to honor her. Another theory is pointed at Michaela's romantic life. I know, when was I going to talk about that, right? In February 2016, two months before her disappearance, Michaela received a bouquet of flowers during her drama class. Someone had a crush on her, but he didn't want to hand the bouquet to her, so he had them delivered to her. Michaela's friends wanted to know who the flowers were from, but Michaela kept it a secret from them. Again, pretty mysterious of her. However, the detectives were able to track the flowers down to a boy from her school, and after they spoke to him, they ruled him out as a suspect. Then there was a young man named Christopher. Michaela had mentioned his name to her best friends, and apparently Michaela had been speaking with him regularly via Snapchat. Christopher was in South Carolina, so he couldn't have been responsible, 
at least not directly, for Michaela's abduction. But one of Michaela's besties told the police Christopher was planning to visit Saskatoon to see his mom. This meant that Michaela could have had plans to meet him that day, but as the detectives tracked down his activity, they found no evidence of him visiting Canada after all. When the police contacted him, he initially refused to be interrogated. However, he sent them an email in which he detailed the conversation topics he had with Michaela. Reportedly, he was trying to help teens quit self-harming and other self-destructive habits, and he was helping Michaela through this. All I can provide for you is that she suffered with self-harm a few years back. Back then, I was helping those who struggled and I encouraged her to fight against self-harm and look towards God. Christopher was ruled out as a suspect. As it turns out, Michaela was talking to a fair amount of boys and men online. In 2016, Michaela was on the lookout for friends and boyfriends. In March, she posted on her Snapchat and one of her Instagram accounts. Looking for Snapchat friends because I have none in real life. Add me, please don't be a greasy f and send me gross ass nudes. Just looking for a friend. One of the boys Michaela had been chatting to was named Josh, a name she'd mentioned to Shelby and Oksana. But the police took months to track a plausible Josh. They didn't have his last name and well, there were a lot of Joshes in Canada. Eventually they tracked down a Josh in Church Bridge. He said that he and Michaela met every week at a youth gathering, but that was all before 2015. He hadn't spoken to her in a long time and the detectives could corroborate his claims. The detectives tried to track down every man Michaela had spoken to on Snapchat. First of all, this was hard. Snaps delete and Snapchat call records aren't registered. Second of all, no one stayed in the suspect pool. Everyone the detectives spoke to was cleared of suspicion. But if you look at Michaela's behavior in the morning of April 12th, it's pretty clear she was waiting or planning on meeting someone. She's looking at the door, she's always on the phone, she goes in and out of restaurants, and she's asking about renting hotel rooms. This is not behavior of someone without plans. So it all boils down to three theories. One, Michaela's disappearance was her own plan. She wanted a new life and she'd been telling her friends she wanted to go on a vacation. A clue that might verify this theory is that on April 12th, Michaela was seen carrying a large backpack. Usually she took a purse to school, so she definitely was prepared for a vacation. But then why would she tell her friends she was leaving if she didn't want to be found? Michaela didn't take her passport, acne medication, or makeup with her. Also, why would she leave the cash pile at home untouched if she was planning such a big trip? It's risky to leave with only $55 on you, unless there's someone else to help you with the money, right? Two, Michaela took her own life. This is a dark theory that no one wants to believe, especially not her family. The supporters of this theory point out that Michaela had been feeling lonely and upset lately. However, she never appeared depressed to her friends or family, and on April 12th, she was very engaged. It was clear she had a plan. And if you're planning to take your life, why would you ask your friends for money, rides to the bank, and help with hotel rooms? Three, Michaela ran away with a man. Throughout the CCTV timeline, Michaela is seen several times speaking on the phone with someone. It's unclear whether this is just one person or more, but it looks like she was in constant contact with someone about her plans. So it wasn't just her plan. Michaela had spoken to her friends about chatting with men and about going on vacation, but whenever Shelby, Oksana, and her other friends would ask for details, Michaela kept quiet. Was this so they wouldn't get caught when they ran away? Was Michaela protecting someone? The last theory seems the most likely, and yet she's never been spotted with another person on April 12th or afterward. Did Michaela run off with a man to live a happy, peaceful life, or did something much darker happen? Did someone groom her into leaving her family and going with him only to kidnap or murder her? I know, it sounds like a horror movie, but if the man had good intentions, why would he be so desperate to keep his identity a secret? First, he and Michaela only spoke on Kick and Snapchat, where phone records are never kept. Then, he had Michaela take her phone apart inside the Wendy's? Was this a way to ensure that she wouldn't be tracked all the way to him? 
Then there was another strange clue. Shelby said Michaela had two phones in April. Did she have a burner phone just to keep in contact with this man? The last clue that points to this dark scenario is simply Michaela's absence. It has been exactly six years since Michaela Bali was last seen at a bus stop in Yorkton. Her mother says she hopes the anniversary will prompt someone to come forward with some new information. In 2022, the reward was upped from $25,000 to a staggering $100,000 for any information leading to Michaela. Today we are here because some angels in Yorkton decided to make a difference. 600 tips have come forward, but they've all led to dead ends eventually. Is Michaela dead and buried a victim of a monster preying on vulnerable teens? Or did she fulfill her dream to get away from home? And if so, why did she want to run away so badly? Thanks for watching, you guys. What do you think about this case? Will Michaela ever turn up? Was this her plan or did she suffer a tragic fate? Let me know what you think in a comment. And before you go, don't forget to like, subscribe, and click that bell button so you never miss another episode. See you next time and keep yourselves safe.